I'd like to begin by um, acknowledging that Banyan Books is on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Tonight's event is sponsored by Banyan. It is the second of six conversations in this online series developed by CAB Publishing. Each event is with contributors from Canada, the US, and UK who have written essays for this anthology about the role of whiteness in their lives and generational family histories. Whiteness is not an ancestor, has just been selected by the editors of Kirkus Reviews to be a featured indie title in their current November 15th magazine issue, a recognition received by less than 10% of their reviewed new publications. Tonight's conversation with editor publisher Lisa Iverson and essayists Sharon Halfnight, Karen Konstantinovich, and Sabina Olson is moderated by Rosalba Stacco. Rosalbo is a psychotherapist, social worker, mediator, and systemic constellation facilitator, and founder of Guelph Family Constellations. She grounds her therapeutic practice by integrating systemic family constellations philosophy, somatic experiencing, and EMDR, and she lives and practices in Rockwood, Ontario. Uh, it's a great honor to have them all here tonight, and I turn it over to Rosalba. Thank you, Jacob. Um, Lisa, I want to thank you very much. I want to thank you for including me and being part of what's happening with your book and with the 12 women who had the courage to come forward and, and, and teach us how to speak their truth. I want to introduce to the rest of you to Lisa. Lisa, maybe just please say hi. So if you're on a screen of five or six, they know which one you are. And as you do that, I just want to say that for over two decades, uh, Lisa has been a family const constellations facilitator and therapist working with groups, including descendants of ancestors who have perpetrated harm or been victimized in circumstances of injustice. In this anthology, she brings together 12 white women to write about the role of whiteness in immigration, colonialism, slavery, and war in their family histories. Their hopeful humanizing stories disentangle themes of innocence, grief, privilege, race, and belonging in a landscape of individual collective healing. Uh, thank you, Lisa. I also want to introduce uh, Karen Constantin. <laughs> Sorry, I know, Karen. It's a doozy. No, no, not to worry. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been practicing and I thought I had it down, <laughs> That's Karen. That's the problem. You're practicing it. <laughs> you just got to let it come off the tongue. Okay, let me try again. Sure. So, yeah. <laughs> Karen Konstantinovich. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful, perfect. All right. What I love about you, what you've said about yourself made me think I should have introduced myself differently too. Mm. Because you said you're talking about being a granddaughter, a daughter, a sister, and a mother. Born on Treaty 4 territory to parents who were themselves displaced by second, the Second World War. She has worked as a CBC radio producer, independent researcher, and most recently an election worker. She's very grateful to live on the land stewarded by the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh uh, people. She took part in Lisa Iverson's Family Matters program in 2012. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Roselva. I hope I say your name properly too, <laughs> so we might be doing a dance around that one. Yeah. yeah. And then there's Sabina. Uh, Sabina Olson, uh, she immigrated to Canada from West Germany in 1975. She's a Reiki master and lives on a small farm in Aldergrove with her husband. She loves helping people to heal and spending time with her beautiful horse, Ava. I think I would like to be spending time with you too, Sabina, and your horse. Um, it sounds like a beautiful setting. And I'd like to introduce you to Sharon Halfnight. She's a Vancouver resident involved in design convening volunteer nonprofit boards, actively supporting generative community dialogue for emergent change. 
She's trained as a social scientist, economics and political science, worked as an IBM computer program and systems analyst, uh, market research focus groups reports, land-based feasibility studies, artist and event contributor, holder of professional practice degree in architecture. Sharon, wow, that's quite a list. Um, and I have to say, in spite of all these um, amazing professional background that you all have, what stands out for me the most is the strength and the courage that you had to write the stories that you told about your family in this book that you came together for. And I think I said it, you've done my work for me. And I'm really grateful to all of you for having done my work for me. And it's also making me say, what else is there for me to do after seeing what you've done? But I'm happy that you opened the door for me. And I'm guessing that you've opened the door for so many more people as they start to read the book. Lisa, you were inspired. I know I, I was with you when you started talking about it in Banff that you, you talked um, during that workshop. And even when you talked about it, I could not envision what you brought together. Um, Can you talk a little bit more about the title of the book? I know you've done it on all the other podcasts, but whiteness is not an ancestor. It's not a, it, it's not a title that, that comes off the top of, I mean, it rolls off the tongue, it, it's catchy. What did you mean by it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for asking. And thank you for being our moderator tonight, Roselba. You're um, I just am so grateful that you're here with us to be in conversation with and to echo what you said. Um, thank you to Jacob. Thank you to Banyan Books. Thank you to Colin. Um, this is a fabulous bookstore for everybody in Vancouver um, who lives there. You're so lucky to have Banyan <laughs> in your city and everybody can celebrate across the world with them online for their anniversary. Just had to say that. Um, that phrase, whiteness is not an ancestor, um, came to me many years ago while leading a constellation workshop. Um, I did a lot of work in Atlanta, Georgia for many years with my work and I loved it. I loved working in Atlanta and it was for me really, um, quite an immersion in the field of whiteness in a way that um, really lives on in, in me. I'm, I'm enormously grateful for those years. And <clears throat> so that phrase, whiteness is not an ancestor, uh, just came to me while leading these groups with people um, through experiences that had to do with working with uh, history, <laughs> generational histories, national history. And it's pretty simple. The phrase is a fact. <laughs> it's a fact. Whiteness isn't an ancestor. But in the States, I'm aware, I'm aware in our conversation tonight, I'm, I'm an American and the rest of you are Canadians, but we're all on this continent that, um, this shared continent that has quite an immigration history to it. And um, certainly 2020 has been a year where visibility of whiteness has, uh, it's come into visibility in a way that's necessary, really necessary. And so the phrase simply describes the fact that despite the enormous impact that whiteness has had and continues to have, it is not where life comes from. <laughs> whiteness is not where our life comes from. It comes from our families. 
and it comes from our ancestors. It comes from this very shared human experience where whatever part of the world we're from, whatever part of the world our ancestors were from, the same thing has happened for all of us where from one generation to the next, life got passed on. And here we are today. <clears throat> if we're listening here, if we're here for this experience tonight, listening to it, the recording, we're fortunate enough, it's a blessing that we're alive in this moment. And whiteness is an idea that has had, like I said, quite an enormous impact. Um, and so this time we're living in, I see it to be a necessary thing that we get clear on what's what, <laughs> because there's a certain element of um, like a ball of yarn, you know, where lots of different threads get kind of rolled up into the same ball. Um, that's part of what's necessary for us to do right now is to kind of separate all the different yarns to see what's what. And, and uh, whiteness is a thread that is very separate from um, the larger, longer, original strand that has to do with life and family and ancestry. So Lisa, why 12 white women? Not white men, white women. Well, um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is um, in the work that I've done over the years, uh, that has included working with a lot of trauma histories. One of the things that happens in an experience of trauma, where there's some, but there's an experience of uh, where trauma happens, where somebody or some peoples do something to another person, or another peoples, where there's a taking of some kind. That's that's. Uh, way to, just, to describe colonialism, to describe slavery. It's one people taking something from another people. Well, in those histories, there's a lot of assumptions that I think are common ones that have that, that we live with that, that assume that men are always the perpetrators and women are always the victims in experiences of trauma. And in these larger collective experiences of trauma, it's not so simple. It's really just not so simple. The, ex the experience of war, the experience of, of slavery, of colonialism, those histories, they're complicated. And so, um, so part of what's required, I think, for um, anything that has to do with whiteness um, is unpacking the level of violence that's there with whiteness. It's, it's been a tool for violence. And it's, and white women, I mean, in the States, we've had a lot this year of visibility of um, that white women have a role. What, they have a, an important role to play in unpacking those histories and unpacking those assumptions. And so that's, that's really at the core of it. Um, that's at the core of it. It's, it's partly a rebalancing of those assumptions about women and men. And um, it, it, from my perspective, blame has no, no purpose other than to keep trauma going. So none of this is about blame. It's about being able to see what is, expand our capacities for truth, this kind of a thing. And I was fortunate enough to know this group of women who, you know, through work and friendship and uh, over the years that I knew they had a capacity to write these stories. Um, that kind of leads me to something that I've heard. 
um, I think it was Karen who said it in our previous meeting. And I'm wondering what everyone else thinks. I mean, here you all, all of you, you put yourselves out. And Karen, one of the things you said when I said, my God, thank you so much for doing this work for me was, well, of course, white women are used to hiding and hiding behind, behind, I don't know what we hide behind, but I can't hide behind you because you're out front. Um, what's your thought on that? You know, it was interesting when when Lisa asked me to write my uh, an essay, I wrote an essay and I gave it to her and she said, hmm, you know, it's a really good essay, but you haven't mentioned anything about whiteness. And I said, well, I thought, you know, you would write the preface and that you would cover it. And Lisa said, yeah, isn't that the way white women like things? You do the work. So, if somebody else do the work. I don't want yeah. to do the work. So it made me go deeper and it made me really look for, for myself, what whiteness means to me. And uh, I was surprised with what I found as I dug around. I was surprised that um, Lisa asked me point blank if I saw myself as a white woman and I said, no. And that was shocking Yeah, because I'm white, right? Yeah. But, but I so identify with other, right? Yeah. And that's what whiteness does is it creates a gradation of experience, mm -hmm. you know? So, so poor white people don't identify with white privilege, right? You know, you hear the word bandied about, well, I'm not privileged. I have to go to a food bank or I'm not privileged. Uh, you know, I, you know, I don't have any education and it's, um, it just creates more and more division and it doesn't uh, open up to any kind of understanding. Um, I, I have to say when you wrote that, I was thinking the same thing. I, I'm not, I didn't identify with as white, even though I know I am very white. So that really spoke to me considerably. Uh, I cannot remember, but one of you talked about the discomfort on talking about being white, but I bet all of you, were uncomfortable about talking about being white. Can you tell me about your experience around that, going into the essay, talking about it, saying, actually acknowledging, yes, I'm white and I'm privileged. I have, I have um, access to things that other people don't have just because of the color of my skin. Anyone in particular? Maybe I'll ask Sabina and maybe I'll ask Sabina because, you know, uh, in, in your essay, you talked about being a blue eyed blonde in Germany. And, and, and that is very different than being a blue eyed blonde in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe even in Canada. Um, I mean, facing that part that in essence, I mean, uh, blue eyed blondes? Yeah. Yes. So what's the question of how this comes how, about talking yeah, about, about, about talking or writing about your white experience or even acknowledging, yes, I'm, of course I'm white. Yeah, it was, it, it was not easy. Um, um, you know, um, you're white and, and I guess maybe I'm a little different from some people. I, I always, um, I kind of always knew the whiteness uh, and the white people had privileges. Um, but when we dug into it, like with Lisa, we, we had several interviews and you know, I, as we said before, at first I didn't think I had anything to say. Uh, there's no story there because I was thinking, well, okay, I don't know anything about colonialism. I don't know anything about slavery. I don't have direct experience with that, but then, um, we persevered and, you know, after about an hour, we go, oh, yeah, well, maybe there is something there. And the whiteness, in my experience, I mean, when I, when I grow up, I think I talk about it in my story, when the, the guest workers came in from Italy and Spain and then the rest of the Mediterranean, the German people were not happy, you know? So that's the, I, what I remember. That's the first time that I remember that 
there was a difference being made between you know the Germans and, and, and being white and not being white. And um, I could never understand why why the German people would not be so happy and, and thankful for you know these Italians to come in and do the dirty work for them because it was dirty work. And um, so yeah, and it's difficult and difficult to see in my own family too how they um, you know, some of them quite prejudiced, you know. Um, but I remember going, you know, going through, through this process of, of doing these, um, the story. Um, it was very difficult at times, you know, and, and reluctance, I was very reluctant to at some time, you know, to continue because it was so, so very uncomfortable. And, um, but I'm really glad I did it, you know, I really, I'm, I'm glad because for myself and, um, you know, hopefully for other people, maybe they get an idea and think, well, maybe there's something there. And I think we all have to, we have to all have to look at it. This is the, this is the time, you know, we started, something started in 2020, maybe the pandemic that gave us a time out. We have to, now is the time where we really all have to face our whiteness. You know, I'm talking about white people, our faces and our, our whiteness, and that we're part of the perpetrators. And, you know, I'm part of a perpetrator. I'm, I'm, the, I'm German, right? And yeah, that, that's in my bones. That's in my, I'm embodying the perpetrator in, in that regard, you know, uh, the Second World War and, and all the atrocities that were, were happening at that time. It, it takes a lot of courage to come forward and say, I'm part of the perpetrators. And, and my thought is just being here on this land, I benefited from um, everything that was done previously. Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether I'm an immigrant or, or if I've been here seven generations, I still benefit. Um, it's hard, though, not to say I wasn't part of it. If I wasn't the one who deliberately did something, um, it's, it's really easy to say I wasn't part of it. What are your thoughts? For so mine? Anybody. I would say, yeah, that's true. It, it's really easy to say I had nothing to do with it. You know, Like here, we're in Canada. And all the land was being taken from the indigenous people. And yeah. they come here and they say, well, I didn't do it, you know. Or even in Germany, I, when I was going after the war, I said, well, there's nothing to do with me. Why should I feel ashamed? Why should I feel guilty of that? None to do with me, but it has everything to do with everybody, you know. So um, th that's a big question to unpack. And uh, Lisa, I'm going to bring this back to you. And I'm bringing it back to you because I, I think that you got a sense of this before we even started this, that there, there was something big that we all need to take responsibility for. Um, how, how would you encourage people to take a look and take a look deeper like you did with the group? How did you get them to look deeper to see about how to take some responsibility here? Mm -hmm. whether you were a new immigrant or someone who's been here for so many generations? Well, <clears throat> I'm a big fan of, um, particularly after over 20 years of being steeped in family constellations, I'm a pretty big fan of acknowledging what is. Some of these really simple um, principles from that work that was developed by Bert Hellinger, many other, many other um, practices be, that came before it. Um, and so all I had to do was ask them. <laughs> and so <laughs> honestly, I think it's, I think we're really, I think it's really a great thing for us to 
uh, this pandemic. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for each of you very much in this conversation and all of the other SAS who are um, with us, you know, listening to this conversation yeah. contributed to this book. It's, uh, we tend to make things sometimes as humans more complicated than they need to be. And I think that is perhaps one of the points of this book is that um, to be able to discern, you know, what is a problem and what's not a problem is a very good question for us to live with, to, for us to like, let that be something that we kind of have as a guide because um, from my perspective, you know, what's already happened is not a problem. There's a whole bunch of truth waiting to be acknowledged. And um, truth is not a problem. And family is not a problem. And so those two things together, that, that's powerful medicine. If we, and for me, that's really a lot of what this is about, you know, the combination of really taking in that truth is not a problem and family is not a problem. Um, the reality is there's a lot of feeling <laughs> involved with both of those two things. And there's a fair bit of, you know, unprocessed trauma and grief in our human history. That's why it's good to do things together. You know, some, we, some things really are, they require doing things with others. That, that was a really key piece of this project. And so I, I called each of them and talked with each person individually. And then we had one meeting. Everybody said yes, yes said yes. We gathered and had our first meeting and it became very clear that um, doing this together, it was a rare thing. I didn't even really fully get it until we, I really didn't, I mean, it was like, I just knew that this was a thing to do, but I couldn't know, how could I know what the future is gonna be like, you know? So we got together and at that meeting, it was quite a palpable feeling of, oh, like this is something to do this with other women, to do this with other people. So those are some of the things that come to mind um, um, I probably came up with three questions based on what you've said, yeah. Lisa. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I've heard you say this one before, family's not a problem, our history's not a problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from a family constellation perspective, I kind of get it. And, um, but I'm thinking that, you know, if someone says, but what happened to me and the trauma that I experienced, mm -hmm. it is a problem. And the collective trauma is a problem. But you're saying, no, it's not a problem. Can you expand a little bit more on that? Why well, is what, not, what happened not a problem? Yeah, well, a problem is something that can be fixed. You know, okay. my car's not working. I'm gonna go take it to the mechanic and hopefully they'll have some ability to, you know, fix it. Yeah. Um, it's concrete, it's solvable, you know that example that that's healing so part of this is a shift in perspective you know the difference between you know so the human experience that has involved loss and trauma it can be healed for sure i see it all the time i know millions of people do many in this conversation have experienced that so it's about that it's about being able to really see you know, the relationship between those two things and, and what's what. Okay, so you're saying that if I can see what happened, and if I can acknowledge what happened, and I can do it in community, which is what you've done with the group of 12, then healing can happen. I think the chances are much greater that happen. <laughs> there's a reason that that phrase truth and reconciliation has legs to it and 
And, you know, this, those of you, you know, all of you here in this conversation who um, have experienced this kind of a process in your country that the U.S. has not, you know, I'm so grateful that I live close to Canada. <laughs> that, as an American, that I, I draw inspiration. I draw a lot of inspiration as an American from Canada that you've, you know, you've taken this on, you know, it's a step, it's a big step to do as a country. It's not the last step, it's not, you know, but it's, it's a big step to do as a, as a country. Yeah. Um, I want to ask a little bit more about the process. Yep. So when you decided that these 12 women were going to come together, and you met, what was the topic of your conversation? Like, did you read your essays? Did you, or what you had, or did you uh, have a chance to talk about what was arising for you? Uh, before the others talk, I'm just gonna say that um, I was very clear from the beginning that it would not serve um, anything other than to activate the human um, comparing <laughs> part of oneself for people to read one another's things during the writing process. So I was pretty strict and clear in that people not reading each other's things okay. till, till they were all written. So, uh, so, um, and then I'm going to, I can say more, but I want to invite the three of you to say Anything you want to say about the process? The question is really, how did you experience the process? Mm -hmm. I could say a little bit about that. It was um, quite a stressful process, not, um, not because I wasn't willing to engage in it, but it was a whole body experience I found. Mm -hmm. And it gave me a way in that group. Um, and I don't think it was at all logical, but there was something about the group of us that allowed us to delve into whatever we had to look at. And more capacity seemed to evolve because of the, the nature of the group itself. I would also say that um, constellation work allows you to develop some awareness and embodied awareness of what's personal and what isn't. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge help in this process because being able to experience something and know that it's happening or happened to someone and also know it's not yours and still have access to it. And I don't know quite how to say that clearly and I don't know whether that was clear, but um, I had all of us, I'm pretty sure, had had those experiences doing constellation work. In my case, I think it's about 10 years ago that I met Lisa. And it was right after my father had died. And we were hosting an event in Vancouver. And that began a process and it began a growing capacity in me to be able to actually ex um, maybe unfreeze that trauma that I found. It isn't all to do with whiteness, but I find trauma has so much shared capacity in all of us to experience um, or to recognize. I don't know, it's, it's not, I, I think it's a human mm -hmm. reality. And so when a personal attachment to whatever's happened shifts, mm -hmm. which is helped by that constellation experience, somehow it's easier to be able to observe and witness what is mm -hmm. and not feel you have to be personally. Um, it's, it's strange because you're accountable, but not tied into it in the same personal way that you might think. Mm -hmm. Is it that there's a more expanded view? Uh, I think it's about capacity. Building capacity. I think it is. And I'm, um, it's also about perspective. Mm -hmm. Did you, uh, when you came together, were constellations any part of it during this writing? 
No, it was simply writing. And did you share emotions that came up with the group? No, but we walked into a process which we're in right now, and this this interview is part of it, um, where we shared together what arrived, okay. and that's been an, a, a hugely um, rich process for all of us, I'm sure. So then, let me ask, if I may, what arrived for each one of you as you went through this process? What What are you willing to share with this group? or with whoever is listening. What shift, what, you know, something that arrived that made you do maybe a 180 or a 90 degree turn to what you were writing, or maybe even change the direction of what you were writing? For me, it was a flood, a chaotic flood. And I had to go through it to make sense of what I could share about whiteness. Mm. And Lisa and I had a, um, an hour and a, a couple of hour conversation that we taped. And in that case, it took me a couple of days before I could listen to it again. And um, I had to encounter a personal pre-birth trauma, which I write about in my story, to even be able to participate and write. Mm. I don't know whether that gives you a sense. Yeah. So, so yeah. personally, my capacity grew tremendously because I was actually able to do that. And that was something, mm. and I didn't do it with anybody holding my hand. I did it in the group and in the container that Lisa provided for us, which would, did not direct us. Okay. And Lisa, you know, when people talk about a container, how do you build that container for them? What's the process that you use to build that container to allow each one to, to write their story the way they're meant to write their story, not anyone else's story or in any, any other way? Um, I think for me to really answer that in a really good way, Rosalba is, it's probably another longer conversation. I'll have to like think a lot about that. Cause I don't know, I just knew how to, I just did it. It's one of those, like I just, um, my, my muscles are flexed in those areas that I spoke about earlier. And, um, and another set of muscles that go with that have to do with really trusting um, that oh, there's always a much larger picture that we're all in all the time and having a lot of faith and confidence in that that we're all you know there's a much bigger picture that we're all in and yeah. in our ancestors I mean I have a I have a pretty um well-developed um prayer meditation practice spiritual life around my ancestors and that I there's no way I could have done this without that so I um, felt from the beginning and still, you know, that just all of it were, were held in a much larger, in that there's a lot of ancestral support and blessing and resource for us to have done what we've done. And that's for, that's everybody. Like that's, that's not just us. That's, I just think that's just part of this too, is for people to realize that. Because because uh, we've all got them. There's yeah. these simple things like we all have ancestors that yeah. this the the North American continent, perhaps out of the history human history behind us and before us. There's our Western trained minds don't really think about that. Yeah. There, there's a question that's come up, Lisa, that I think makes sense to ask you now. Uh, they're asking about the importance of people coming together as groups and yeah. collectives to find ways of moving out of denial yes. and, and hold on and ongoing violence of systemic racism against First Nations. Yeah. Why is the support of one another so important? I mean, you decided that healing happens as a group and that's why you brought 12 people together. But could you maybe add to that? Well, um, 
the history before us and behind us, colonialism, that those were group. That was a group experience. It wasn't an individual. It wasn't like one person. There wasn't one colonizer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, these are group experiences. So that is a part of the time we're living in, I think, is also to realize that the North American construct focuses so heavily on the individual. It's completely unnatural. So it's natural to um, access the power and uh, resource of groups for many, many, many things. Yeah. In including something like this. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I was just going to say, I don't think it has to be a tightly structured group either. I think it can be really informal structures. Mm -hmm. It can be conversations that you have with your neighbors. Mm -hmm. When we're allowed to get out of our homes and visit more than one person, it, it can be in, in that context as well, too. But I think, you know, it's, it, you know, it's like Lisa's right. It, it was not the system wasn't created by one person. It was created by a collective. And the only way it's ever going to kind of get some resolution around it is collectively. And it really helps to know that you're not alone. Yeah. You know, it, it, you know, I think a lot of white people think uh, they don't have stories that they yeah. don't have, you know, that, that there's nothing there, but there is. And it's a big, long history that we all come from. Yeah. And, you know, I mentioned this in our earlier conversation, the arc of history is very long. We yes. have, you know, in my family alone, you know, both sides uh, were raised in areas that had three different countries. You know, in my mother's case, she was um, born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire under the state of Galicia, then it turned over to Poland, then it became part of Ukraine. The major cities all have three different names. The same thing with my father. And that was just in their lifetime. And I think if we all start looking back in our ancestral history, we'll see that, yes, sometimes we've been the victim. And yes, sometimes we play the role of the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. And it's, and I think that's an important play, place to come from, to understand that. That kind of brings us back to the role of the perpetrator and acknowledging the perpetrator inside each, each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes it's really easy to think about the perpetrator in me that belongs to my father or my grandmother or so on, but really the perpetrator is also in me. Um, Karen, th there was something that um, we talked about, and I want to bring it up again, because you talk about the arc of history, and, and that is uh, that was really helpful to me to hear it the first time, so I'm thinking it's going to be helpful for other people to hear more about it too, because one of the questions I had asked you before was, how do you um, come to terms that, yes, you come, your ancestors were displaced, and then your family immigrates to, to Canada. Place, to a place where other people have been have displaced. Have been displaced. Yeah. And how do you come to terms with that? So Well, I, mean, I think I think big part of it is what something Lisa said at the beginning. You acknowledge what is. That's the truth, right? Yeah. You know? Um, this is the truth. This is what is. You know, my people were displaced and we came over and displaced your people. Mm -hmm. I don't know what we do about it. I don't know how we resolve it, but it's the truth. And it's a place to start from because I think for too long, we've kind of hidden from the truth or not wanted to acknowledge it. And it's that hiding that creates a problem. Um, the, the hiding is really um, something that's, that's really tweaking my mind. How do we hide? How, how, can I ask you how you thought you were hiding? Hmm. Before you wrote the story, hmm. how do you think you were hiding? It's a really it, good question. I don't know quite how to answer it right now, but I think, you know, I mean, I think the, the truth of it is, is that, uh, yeah, it, 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 yeah. It's hard, it, it's, I, I guess, 
you know, I, I suppose that in a way I haven't really hid because I kept my father's name, which is not an easy one, right? You know, so a uh, sort of part of me has always kind of wanted to identify as somebody other, right? Uh, I guess what I was hiding from was my whiteness, right? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I was so identified. I am, I still am identified with being other, right? Not, not quite white enough, not quite enough of a white woman to be included in the white women's group, right? And I think that that othering is a, a really, that's another truth. We do it to each other. We do it to ourselves. We other, other um, aspects of ourselves that we don't want to look at. Mm -hmm. We make them bad rather than that's just what it is. It's yeah. there. Yeah. And that was what you wrote that really spoke to me was that this thing about considering myself another. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking that's probably how I hit too. Yeah. Uh, what about Sabina? Did, any thought on that? Do you... Um, did you well, what, think you were hiding? Well, what came up very interesting what what Karen just said, like I had a my last name, my, my maiden name, my dad's name. It's very difficult, very, very German. And I remember when I got married, I got married to a Dane. And I, I couldn't get rid of my last name fast enough. Mm. I was so happy mm. that, you know, because it's part of the shame, I guess, and part of the guilt of being German. I said, okay, I can drop that. And at least then people won't ask me right off the bat, oh, you're German, you know, whatever, you know, even though I mean, I still have the accent, but it's not quite as, as pronounced when you have that German last name. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I would have to say, um, being part of the family in Addis group for three years, I could not have been part of that book without that work. You know, could not have done it because I guess Sharon said it so eloquently. Uh, it, it just, it takes the personal out of it, right? You, you, you acknowledge the, the, the history and you acknowledge the family part of it. And then it's so much easier to say, yeah, okay, that's part of it, but it's not all of it. And um, I can still go on and, um, and be German in my in my heart, and and I know the one thing that has really changed that because you know I told you before I was so feeling so ashamed ashamed and guilty about being German. Um, with the with the constellation work, it allowed me to really embrace and be so totally happy about the German culture, the composers most of all, mm -hmm. and the poets and the authors. And it embraced that richness that is there. And that came before, you know, before the, the atrocities. And I have to, more, I, I thought about it today again. Um, how is it fair for one country to have so many fantastic composers? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so many fantastic yeah. poets. And, you know, I listened to this, this really lovely young, Asian lady the other day playing a Beethoven piece. And wow, in their culture, she was really actually probably from China, you know? So how she can interpret that when their music is so very, very different. Yeah. I marvel at it. It's just, it's so universal, right? And for that, I'm so tremendously grateful for that, you know, with that work that I had to do the work and I did it gladly. And, it's just so much better now, you know, it's just life. I can, I can look at the history and I can say, well, okay, it, well, it is what it is. We can't change it, you know? It seems like it's an acceptance of self. And it almost sounds like, I mean, you, you talked about shame. Um, and I know that Karen talked about shame in her book and her essay as well. Um, but it's almost like moving from this total discomfort to even apologizing for being white, to acceptance of whatever it is that happened um, and just being accountable for moving forward. Mm -hmm. Am I reading that right? Or what am I missing here? No, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. You accept it and um, 
it, it allows you to move on. It allows you, you know, I feel so much lighter. Like I must have walked around with a big bag of weeds on my shoulder, you know, and always trying to hide, oh, I, yeah, I'm not really German, maybe I'm Swedish or whatever. But um, yeah, I can't, I can't say enough about it. You know, you do the work and you acknowledge what it is, um, it frees you up, it frees yeah. you up to live your life without all that baggage, you know? It, it doesn't mean, I, I, I don't get me wrong, I don't disregard it and I, I feel terrible what happened. But um, on the other hand, you can't just live your life with that on your head all the time. You know, you have to, you have to get over it and you have to do the work to get over it and acknowledge it to be able to move on. And like I said before, it's, it's with me and I'm very sad about it, what happened. Very, very sad. I'm, I'm, you know, my heart's broken when I think what happened. And, uh, but there's the other side of it. And, yeah. um, it's, it's quite something that we're talking about shame and feeling embarrassed about being white. And yet I think Lisa in the book, I think it was uh, in the part that you wrote that in North America, we like to see ourselves as the rescuers and the good guys. Mm -hmm. And yet here we are looking at, you know, this is a part of ourselves that we're not the good guys and mm -hmm. yet we're just human. So we're trying to accept our humanity and we're also moving out of um, hiding behind, we're trying to be the good guys, we're the rescuers. Yeah, I would suggest that um, it for in the States, it's out of a, a centuries old identification with um, rescuer or victim. And those phrases, I mean, just to reference um, perpetrator, victim, rescuer, that kind of a trauma role triangle. That's what we're referencing here. Yeah. In, the, in the US, we've got a longstanding identification with rescuer or victim, but never perpetrator. That's how we got Donald Trump as our president. From my perspective, um, one of the one of the really important um, teaching from Bert Hellinger that I've appreciated has to do with the consequences of excluding someone or something from the landscape of what is in our families, in our generational histories, in our nation's histories. So in the States, I would suggest that um, Donald Trump has done a fabulous job representing our perpetrator in office. He's represented the colonizer. He's represented the enslaver in a way that we apparently have needed, <laughs> you know, in, in, in our country. Um, what gets excluded gets represented <laughs> is the concept. And yeah. so, and so um, you know, and it is a very, very human landscape. This, everything that we're talking about, all of the, the complexity of human history and all that's happened it's easy to miss the fact that we're still here. Our species is still here. With all that has happened with the, the, the amount of the long arc of history and wars and like everything, it's like, wow, we're still here. Yeah. And so. Um, yeah, and we, we have a tendency to think that, that we're the first ones yeah, to experience right. this, you know? There have been countless pandemics yeah. there have been many wars there have been you know 
it goes way back. And, you know, it's, I, I think one of the things that I've found so helpful about doing the, the, this work is that, you know, your ancestors made it through, right? Mm -hmm. Somehow, in spite of all the difficulties, they made it, they made it, they, they were able to pass life on. Yeah. And that's the source of strength going to say especially in reading yours um karen the european history is war upon war upon war mm -hmm. it doesn't matter which neck of the woods that you go to it's it's about one kingdom uh, conquering another kingdom it doesn't matter where you come from i i have a couple of questions here that have come up and our time is going to be limited so i i really want to ask them because one is about constellation work and i know lisa you're the uh, family constellation uh, facilitator, but all of you have that experience. So mm -hmm. maybe we can start with you and others can add to it. How can family constellation work help transform racism in society? Does it only work family by family or can it be done for larger groups on a societal level? Um, I would say yes to all. What I would, su what I would suggest though is that um, our larger society is with us in every single constellation experience. So again, the Western mind likes to kind of put things in categories. And, you know, where I would, for me, I would just say, wherever you go, there you are. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you know, wherever we are, um, you know, our parent, it's all with us. It's all with us. And so, um, I could, I could do what I did. I had permission just in my own self as a person here with this project, um, because of how much I, um, spend time in my own, um, meditation practice with my parents and my grandparents and, you know, my siblings, my, you know, so whenever any, I say this just because whenever anybody asks about the larger picture questions, it's great to also notice um, like what's, it's easy to, for that to sometimes be another sneaky way of getting away from our family. <laughs> so, we, we, That's so we true. Tend, okay. We tend to be a creative. <laughs> we tend to be a very creative species, and so every yeah. time, every time we nurture a sense of perspective that our parents are just the right parents for us, mm -hmm. that makes a big contribution to our society. And the way to test that is imagine if, if everybody did that. Yeah, you know, it would have quite an effect. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I'm wondering if Karen and Sabina and Sharon maybe can even talk from their own experiences as to how maybe having done their personal work has actually expanded beyond. I mean, all of everyone said about their perspective became larger. I, I have to say, I came across a term the other day, I think I may have mentioned it before, called reflective activism. And so it's the whole idea of you know, you look outside and you see all these, you know, ills, problems, issues, uh, they're also inside of you, you know, and, you know, to use the Donald Trump example, he wouldn't be the president of the United States had not a lot of people have that Trumpian aspect inside of them. I think we all carry a little bit of Donald Trump inside of us. And so, you know, reflective activism would be kind of cleaning it up inside of you. And then, then you can go, you know, it's, and it's not an either or, it's a simultaneous thing. It's not, it's, I think it's a simultaneous thing. I don't think, you know, it's, um, I heard a term the other day called, I, I think it's uh, two-eyed vision, you know, it's sort of like, that long look and that micro look, it has to be both at the same time. So how did you, how did you through a constellation, because I think that's the question that they're asking, how did you through a constellation see the, the um, how did you put it, the up close and far away? 
Karen, but you called it an eye. A sick. Tell me again. Um, how? how to, I, and somebody wants an example of a constellation that. Oh, that well, well, they're not really asking yeah. for an example, but they're asking how how a constellation can help with that. And I'm saying all three of you have experienced that. You've experienced looking at something up close and yet getting a wider perspective because you've experienced it up close. And, and my guess is even in writing, like we can talk about setting up a constellation, but and with people or with figures or whatever, but in essence, all of you in your mind's eye, when you did that work, you were doing constellation work as well. And things were shifting as, as you were doing that work. It, it must have, like, um, based on my experience, it, it, things start to shift in your mind's eye as well. Can, can anybody can I give an example? It's not yes. an intellectual process at all, in my experience. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it, because you're accessing something other than your mind. And, and yes. there's a wisdom in it. I'm remembering standing on Whidbey Island in a constellation circle. And we were working on one of our family histories. And we were representing, and in, in that case, I was given the privilege of representing um, uh, a black slave. And there were a whole row of us standing there. Um, and I remember just having a very strong sense of knowing as that representative that all I wanted the, um, the owner in that situation who was struggling to try and understand what was going on. It was just not initially in capacity at all to understand it, to be able to just recognize what is and then come to their full self and start to deal with it rather than hide from it. Or, I mean, and that's me adding the hide from it from this conversation that wasn't in my mind at all, it was mostly wanting as that representative to just have the full humanness come forward and then deal with the situation and make it, um, make it humanly equitable. Like, so that that person didn't feel inside like a slave they knew their value as a human um, and they were in a situation that was quite intolerable and having the other person who did appear to have the power and the purpose be the perpetrator in that situation do their own work enough that they could stand up and become more human and help to right the situation was what was wanted i don't know whether that's helpful but it seems to me that that begins to bring the experience you can have which was not personal to me in any way, it taught me something. And yeah. I, well, okay, maybe I get it because I understand the work. Um, so yes, yeah, so when you were standing and you were in the place of a, of a slave, you One, had- Seven or eight in a row. Yeah, you had a certain experience and you had an understanding of what it was like. Now, people who don't understand constellation work don't necessarily understand that you, when you stand in that place, you, you pretty well start to embody and feel what you are representing, mm -hmm. okay? And then the person who's the slaveholder is also getting, or representing the slaveholder, is also feeling and experiencing something. And that helps him have a better understanding of what that person was feeling at the time. If they're willing to. If they if have the capacity to go there, but okay. there, there's just an opportunity in that to see a broader picture. And I don't know, I, I, I find this conversation challenging because it's hard to hold the nuances that arise. Yeah. And if I can't put them into words, I can't share them. So I think I'll just rest at that. But um, it was a sense of wanting the um, better possibilities to, emerge. And I think that takes having done some personal work to develop the capacity mm -hmm. to be able to let what is show and you have to own your perpetrator, we've all got it. Mm -hmm. But if you're so busy being innocent, mm -hmm. and pushing it all away and denying it, then the whole group can't move on. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's why reconciliation and truth go together because more mm -hmm. possibilities emerge for everybody because we're connected if you can do your own work and knowing your family story gives you a way to stand in mm -hmm. what's real for you and that's huge help mm -hmm. okay so when you're talking about doing your own work 
my sense is all three, all four of you have done a fair bit of your own work outside of, of um, and sharing, I know you talk about it in, in, in your essay as well, outside of doing, of writing this essay, what kind of other anti-oppressive work have you done or have you tapped into? Are you asking me? Uh, all of you. But I, I think I'll start with you, Sharon, simply because I know you already t wrote about it in your cards, mm. oh, sorry, in your essay. Okay. And I really would like you to talk about those cards because oh, they, right. they those sound cards. like one. Yeah. I went and got my deck so that I had it here. Okay. Um, this is a group that um, has ongoing exploration of decolonializing. What, what could a decolonial future be? So it's named Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures. And um, I was involved in a cradle project where we built cradles for um, babies um, who had not made it into life from the first, from their experience in hospitals of um, just not coming through the birth process. And there were an astounding number of them who were buried at a, a Vancouver cemetery and needed to be, um, or want the, the cemetery wanted to help um, create a memorial so that people had a way of, of recognizing their loss and grieving. Um, in that process of making the cradles, I was gifted by an opportunity. The whole group of us worked on these cradles and then we also drew cards from this deck and it's called, um, I wonder if you can see it, Without Modernity, mm -hmm. Without Modernity, and there are questions in it, and I speak some of them, some of them are hardish questions, some of them are long haul questions, some of them are, what would it be like without modernity the way we have it, some of them are just random invitations, so it, it, it was already work, as you say, work done by others that was shared and it gave us a chance to talk and share individual experiences. They were very different, but we ended up speaking about baby losses in our families. We ended up speaking about what it was like to leave a home country and have family there. There were a number of younger ones in our group who'd come, some from South America, um, some one from Africa, some from Europe. It was a, a wonderfully rich mixed um, group. So the stories were amazing. And in that process, the sharing again, gave an opportunity for something larger to show itself to all of us. Mm -hmm. I think that's says it enough. Mm -hmm. Says it enough. Um, Sabine, Karen, is there something that you can add to that? Like, dip, I know you all have done, you couldn't be here unless you've done other work in other communities looking at this issue. I, I honestly think that const, the constellation format for me uh, was really um, just a very good experience in terms of understanding our human history and our, our shared human experiences like Sharon raised, baby losses, deaths, yeah. immigration, all, all of those things, uh, you know, really come alive for me in a constellation circle. But it also comes alive for me, you know, in, in really good literature, you know, and in reading about history, and in, um, you know, having conversations with people, and, you know, just trying to connect in all the ways that we try to connect with people in our day to day lives. The question that has come up, um, is really about how does, once you acknowledge what is, mm -hmm. how do you move forward? Mm -hmm. And how do you move forward with that knowledge and with the idea of being able to do something different? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a great question. And um, it, it makes me think to say what I was thinking earlier which is that we don't, <clears throat> we typically in our, in our Western culture don't, we don't see that acknowledging what is that acknowledging truth, that these are not passive things. It takes a lot of present, it's a, it's a powerful combination actually of presence and action to be able to acknowledge, acknowledge truth. 
in a grounded and embodied way. That, those are actions. And so the what comes after that, I have, a feel, I have a lot of feeling of trust about, well, we'll figure that out. But we can't rush through this. No. We cannot rush through this. Mm -hmm. There's been, for me, when I was writing the um, Ancestral Blueprints book, it became, and I just steeped myself in a, a lot more of, you know, self-learning around American history and like, how did we get here, et cetera. It became really clear. It's like, oh, they, you know, the whole, our, our American history around slavery, they, they like, they tried to stop. There were, there was, there was a group of people, there were many efforts early on to try to stop slavery. And they're like, you know, we'll, you know, how are we going to keep going as a country without it? So we'll just pass it on to the next generation and they'll figure it out. Well, the clock is up on that. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> you know, really like this is the time. No, the, it's like the alarm clock has gone on and that's a good thing. For me, I would say that that must mean that we're equipped, we're resourced. The, ta the a task that arises, arises when there's enough resource there there's resource to be able to meet the task i i believe that to be true i sense that to be true i, I think the other part though with acknowledging what is is then also accepting the consequence yes. so if i can go with guilt. yeah and accepting the guilt um yes. was that you sharing accepting yeah. the guilt yes of course and bo both go hand in hand Yes. and and carrying the burden of the guilt yes it's strengthening it's absolutely strengthening we need it for god's sakes you know there's a in the american soul there's a big old collective shame pit in our american soul that there is a collapse it, it's a collapsing effect our uh, economic debt as a country combined with how much money we have put into our military defense that's not a surprise I mean, let's think about what that represents. Yeah. The debt, the debt in the soul and our the amount of energy we spend trying to defend ourselves from what is. That's not and that's not gonna move us forward in a good way. There's a denial in what is. Of course, of course. Right. So that's why again, it's like these group of women have demonstrated with what each of you have written about what's possible accessing you know the simple human thing that has to do with being a descendant being a daughter being a son claiming who and where we come from there's a strength there's an irreplaceable strength that comes from connecting um with our ancestors and um it it, it equips us to then you know face the things that are difficult totally doable it's paradoxical. Yeah. Because if, mm -hmm. if my saying, um, I, I guess I'm thinking there's, there was one story, it's it, it, I, Sonia's story about the, her grandmother um, yes. connected to the lynching of yes. a black man. Yes. Just coming out and saying, yeah, yes. it's true. That happened. Yes. Uh, on one hand, it's accepting what is that happened. Yes. And, and also coming clean. It's, almost um oh i hate to say this but almost like um confessing to the world th this is me this is authentically me and i'm and i'm willing to take responsibility for this now well we do it together yeah it's it's the facing again you know back to the group tasks it's a very big bar whiteness is a very big barn raising <laughs> you know, <laughs> it takes a lot of people to, you know, build a barn. Yeah. You know, think of any group project that requires a lot of people and facing whiteness is one of those. What's the best thing or the, um, I don't know, maybe I've asked this question before, but I, I, I'm saying one word for all of you. Mm -hmm. one, what's the best thing that happened from facing your whiteness? If it's possible to do it in one word. I say courage. I got courage. You gained more courage. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. 
Otherwise, it wouldn't be here. <laughs> I'd say steadfastness. I'm drawing a blank right now. <laughs> you know, and I and I think I just take to heart what Lisa said that sometimes these things take time, right? And uh, it takes time. So I'll give you a word, Karen. Mm. I would say presence because mm. you're staying and willing to yes. stay with yeah. the with what with whatever is wanting to come through. Mm -hmm. And Lisa, I, what was this like for you? Oh, that's a good cliffhanger because it's 744. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll we'll do this again and we'll figure out the best way to do it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Roselba. Uh, you are most welcome. I was feeling very privileged for being part of this. And we need to thank Jacob Steele. He was the event coordinator from this. Yes. And of course, Banyan Books, because yes. without them, we wouldn't be able to have this evening. And thanks to everyone who put their questions through. I tried okay. to cover some of them in, 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 the, so in the course of the conversation. In the meantime, thank you for joining us. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for thank being you. part of this yeah. discussion. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you to everybody. Okay, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.